so this morning I, I am actually wanting to add something to a, a message that I shared a couple of weeks ago and um, pr probably most of us were not in the room or many of us were not in the room at that time so I'm just going to kind of revise a little bit because what I want to talk about what I started to talk about was legalism and legality and what actually happened we spent most of that session talking about legalism and just um, to quickly revise what we what we looked at was the, the fact that legalism is uh, an obsessive focus on minor details especially with regards to the law an obsessive focus and when I say obsessive I mean a, a, an attentiveness to little things that are not really important to the point where a person is obsessed it's like the, the typical example is the scribes and Pharisees and you know how they were they, they, they were very concerned they were ready to make a, a, a major issue out of the fact that the disciples did not wash their hands before they ate they made little things into mountains it, it legalism is characterized by an attitude that places the law above the person I want to repeat that because it's a very important uh, principle that you can use when you want to think about legalism. Legalism is like a policeman sees you going through a stop sign. He stops you and you say, Officer, my wife is having a baby and I need to get to the hospital right away. And the policeman gives you a ticket. That's legalism. It's, 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 it's the law takes precedence above the person. That's typical of legalism. And it was not just it, 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 it was not just the scribes and Pharisees who were legalists, but it, it, it exists today, very much. And and we, we made the point that um, legalism is is a word that probably is used most often in the context of the Christian religion. You don't often hear it referred to in terms of society and how it operates in general, or um, other religions. And we look at the question, why is legalism so, so tied, so linked to Christianity? We, we saw that this is because the Old Testament is essentially a legalistic testament, a legalistic covenant. God, God actually established legalism as a way of life for the Jews. And if we don't like that, it's just the truth. We, we can look at the Bible and see that very easily. A man was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. What happened to him? The mandate was that he was to be stoned to death. The law, the system of the law was extremely legalistic and God ordained it to be so. And we also looked at the reason. I don't want to go back over the entire message here today, but we looked at the reason why God operated like this. And we saw that there was a very good reason. When we examined it, we saw that there was a very good reason. If you are dealing with a certain kind of material, you need to be legalistic. For example, if you're in a place where, for example, they are, they are constantly breaking down people's houses and shooting people and they are, they are raping people. and it, it, it's, a, it's a society of absolute devilish people. You can't operate on the basis of tolerance and uh, ask them for cooperation. Sometimes in that kind of situation, you need an iron fist. You, you have a different system based on the material you're working with. And the Apostle Paul teaches us this because he tells us in, in Galatians chapter 5 that when we were children, he's speaking of the Christian church, when we were children, we were placed under the elements of the world, under the law. Because that's the kind of people we were. Wherefore then serve at the law? It was added because of transgressions. The law was given to deal with a lawless people. And so because of the nature of the people, God had to be very strict with them. Otherwise, he would have, he would have made no progress with those people. But we saw that it was a teaching tool intended to lead them to a higher place. So, the question was asked, if God initiated legalism, if God instituted legalism among the Jews, and, and it's, it's many places, it's not just in the, in the case of the man who was picking up sticks to Sabbath, you can see the man who touched the ark, okay? 
He was trying to stop the ark from stumbling over. He touched the ark. And what happened? He dropped dead. You can see a, 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 a very strict attentiveness to what seems to be minor details. So when the scribes and Pharisees come along and they say, why are you washing, eating with unwashed hands? When they say, why, why, why don't you pay tithe or whatever? They were being true to the system that they were coming out of. So somebody asked, why then did Jesus blame them? And the point is, Jesus says, this is, this is a condemnation. That light has come into the world. That's the point. Up to a certain point, this kind of thing is all right. But here's the condemnation. Light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. That is a problem. Jesus said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have had any cloak for their sins. In other words, he came, a light into the world, and he shone a light brighter than anything they had ever seen before. And granted, many people were bewildered. The disciples themselves, they were, they were concerned that Jesus was offending the Pharisees. They, 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 were, they were bewildered, they were mystified that Jesus was saying so much that was against what they had been trained and taught. But they saw the light in Christ. And in the light of that light, they were able to rise above their former teachings and be lifted into a different realm. Don't you think sometimes that this is exactly what we need today? We need that kind of, we need to see the light. We need to see the light that can, able, can enable us to rise above our former traditions, our deep-seated prejudices, and to see God and to see his truth as it is. You know, some rules are deeply established, but when you look at them, they don't make sense in the light of the God of love. And that has to be the bottom line. When you look at the God of love, what does the Bible look like? What do the rules look like? What, do they, what does the gospel look like? This is the beauty that we are discovering. We, have the, we are discovering that when you have found the key, when you have found the key of the character of our God, you can unlock any door in the Bible. And sometimes when you open it, it's not what you were expecting to find. But that is the beauty of, of the reality that the path of the just is like a shining light that grows more and more towards a perfect day. The more we understand, the more we admire God. The more we admire God, the more we love God. The more we love God, the more we want Him to be integrated into our lives. And the more that happens, the more power and the more glory appears in our experience. It's a beautiful sequence of events, and that's the way God intended it to be. So, we did look at that question of legalism. And we saw that God abolished the system of legalism. And his people were not supposed to be legalists. Uh, we, we are told several places that the letter kills. Romans 7 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. The letter kills legalism. But the spirit gives life. Understanding the principle behind what is happening. It gives life. Not just the principle. But actually having the spirit of God. Which is the living law. This gives life. So this principle is the truth of the new covenant. But today, I want to look at the other L word, legality, legality. Because I think it's very important that we understand there is a difference between legalism and legality. Because one is good, one is necessary, one explains a great many things, and the other one is something that has been abolished for God's people. So we have basically concluded that legalism is not what God wants of his people. People who are legalistic are, I would say, they are involved in childish religion. And I accept and I agree that many Christians are infants in their relationship with God. I have been there. I have been there. And all of us have probably been, been there where, where we have become obsessed with little things. All right? Look, she's not wearing a hat. Look, her dress is a little bit more than two inches off the ground. Look, she has a little color on her cheek or something. It's true that some of these things reflect on what happens inwardly, but we don't become obsessed about these things 
because we are we understand principle and we are focused on the greater matters of the law which jesus spoke about anyway but today i want to talk about legality and of course i want to use the bible as a foundation of what i want to say so i'm going to go to my bible screen here now first of all i want to give my definition of legality and um i i like to do this because sometimes when you go to the the, the dictionary definition i find that some of these definitions are not really so accurate in terms of how the bible expresses things so i'm kind of using my own um, understanding but i understand legality to, to refer to a principle of fair play legality is, is is based on the principle of fair play it's based on it's focused on justice and i would say for the most part legality is um it gives a priority to people it's intended to safeguard people um what is the purpose of it it, it is to defend individual rights i know that um in in in, in it, it kind of stands out in a place like america maybe in some of the other countries where we live in third world countries we are so accustomed to, to being abused and to people stepping out, the, the authorities stepping outside of the law, that we take it for granted. But somewhere in America, in America, they like to stand on their rights and they like to talk about the Constitution, probably based on the history of that country. But the point is, they, they, they have a point because the law was intended to safeguard the rights of people. The, the point behind the law is that it, it creates equality, it creates some kind of equity so that you have it, it is supposed to protect the strong against the weak if it was not for the law the strongest man will beat you take away your land take away your car take away your property whatever it is and you have no recourse because you're not as strong as him so the law is basically the law was founded was established in order to protect the rights of individuals it was to prevent abuse and to prevent people taking steps or, or to taking advantage of other people it, it provides some kind it's supposed to i say supposed to because of course we know there are abuses in the human system there are unfair laws and even the fair laws are misused so that people are are, are abused and taken advantage of so i'm really speaking about the principle of what it was intended to do maybe not so much how it is carried out but the point i'm making is that legality the legal system is not bad it's not bad. Anywhere you're looking for fair play, anywhere you're looking for balance and equality, in the system of hum humanity, you always have a legal system. And so I think most of us will agree that the legal system is basically good. Now, I'm not commenting on where it is misused. Right now, they are making legal rules even in this pandemic, they're making legal rules that have people up in arms because they feel that these laws, some of these laws are unreasonable and unfair and they're not based on the rights of the individual. So that's another story. But what I'm saying is that the legal system in general is intended to be for the good of, of each individual. So it's, it's, not, it's not bad to have a legal system. And you see, I'm making a distinction between legalism which is focused on elevating the law at the expense of the person. But legality is a system that is intended to, to preserve the rights of each individual. So I would say that legalism was a temporary thing. God established legalism for the Hebrews because it was a teaching tool and it was also to protect people in a, in a primitive system. It was temporary and the, the system of legalism is gone. And when Christians become obsessed with legalism, it hampers their Christianity. But le legal principles remain forever because where people live with other people, you need some kind of protection to, to, to protect the weak from the strong and to make sure we live together in a system that we can understand each other. 
at least in, in a system where sin exists, in a system where sin exists, we need a legal system. I believe that in the world to come, I don't think we're going to need a legal system. I don't think I'm going to need to be protected against you because you are stronger than me. I think the Spirit of God in all of us will, will provide such love that legal protection will be completely unnecessary. But in this system where sin exists, the legal system is necessary. And as long as sin exists, it will always be necessary. Now, from this I'm going to go to another point, and it is this. It's the truth that God operates legally. Let me repeat that. God operates legally. Can you understand what I'm saying? In other words, if, 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 if a legal system is intended to protect the weak against the strong, then even God needs to ensure that the weak are protected from his strength. That sounds a little strange, but I'll explain what I mean. Everybody, including God, sometimes has enemies. God has enemies. God has enemies. And what I'll tell you about the enemies of God is that they are much weaker than God. They are much weaker than God. As much as people might fear Satan and, may, and might, might be in awe of Satan, Satan is just a speck, just a speck of dust. He's just a little snap of God's fingers. He's much weaker than his creator. And because of this, there has to be a system to protect Satan from God. I know we don't normally look at things from this perspective. Nobody wants to protect Satan, right? All of us would be happy if he dropped dead tomorrow morning. But um, this is why in a, in, in a system where everything is done in a fair way, you have to have legal rules to protect even the wicked from the righteous simply on the basis of I am stronger than you. That's why we have legal system to protect everybody from anybody else who just wants to use brute force and wipe out a person. Let me show you something about this principle of what we have to expect of God. Look at this verse in Genesis 18 and verse 25. Well known, but I love it very much. I like it from several points of view. But let me just look at one thing here this morning. Abraham is talking to God. And I don't think Abraham know, knows God better than I do or knows God's character better than I do. But he was certainly one of God's best friends. And I want you to notice his liberty that he's taking here. He says to God, that be far from thee to do after this matter. Okay, look at this presumptuousness. He's telling God what it is right for God to do. He's telling God what kind of person God is. He's reminding God of the person he is. He's saying, that be far from thee to do. It's like I'm saying to, to you, Brother Began, come on, man, you know better than this. Come on, man, I don't know you to be this kind of person. You are not this kind of person. I'm reminding you that based on your integrity and your character, you cannot behave like this. He's taking a great liberty with God. But why is he doing this? It's because he knows God. He understands God's character. And one of the, I would say, I would say to you brothers and sisters that the, the greatest truth in the universe that you can stand upon is that God is faithful. In other words, God does not go contrary to his principles. You can trust and depend on God. If you can't, then we're all in great trouble. But Abraham knew, and he knew this is God's character. Therefore, based on God's character, God cannot do this. He could predict what God could, would do because he knew God's character. And he said, look here, you are not like this. This is far from you. To slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. And look at his question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? It's a daring question, but it, I, I love this passage because 
<laughs> I think God is so amazing because the king of the universe submits himself to man's judgment. And even though Abraham is his friend, he submits to Abraham's judgment. Abraham says, look here, you are the judge of all the earth. What? Am I not to expect you to do what is right? Why should I expect God to do what is right? Why should I, I depend upon it that God will do what is right? Because I know him and because I know this is the foundation of everything he stands for. He does what is right. And right here means, right here means what is fair and what is just. That's what the word means here. So the point I'm making is that God himself is limited by something. And what he's limited by is his own own justice and his own right so even in dealing with satan who is weaker than god god must operate on the on the basis of what is just and what is right in other words i'm telling you there is a legal system that limits the way god behaves i hope everybody is understanding me nobody can make a rule to govern god who who who's going to make a rule to control God. Who's going to punish God if he breaks the rule? Nobody can dare to presume to step into that realm. But what we can know is that God's own character is a rule that is stronger than any iron bond. It's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a rule, it's a legal system, God's own character, that binds the hands of God that he cannot behave in a way that is unfair or unrighteous. This is what Abraham was talking about when he was daring to have this argument with God. He says, look here, you are the judge of all the earth. Isn't it fit and right for you to do what is right? So God's justice, God's sense of fair play, this is what Satan is play, playing upon. Satan knows he's guaranteed to have some time. He knows he's guaranteed to get a listening ear because God will not behave in an unfair way. I tell you something, if, if, if God was unfair and if God was unjust and if God was illegal, the devil would find a hole to hide and he would never come out of it because he would know that at any moment he could drop dead simply by the snap of God's finger. Think about what I'm saying. Because you can recognize in a moment that it is the absolute truth. All, all that is going on in this world, the craziness, the mayhem, it is based on this great principle that God is limited by his own legal principles. It's very evident. It's, it's something that um, sometimes we don't talk about it a lot. But once you begin to think about it, you can see that it has to be so. If there is not such a system in place, established by God's own character, God's own nature, if there is not such a system in place, then of course, you have to ask yourself a question. Why does God allow so many terrible things to happen? Where is God? This is what the atheist asks. This is what the ignorant person asks. When the child is being raped, when children are thrown into the fire, when starvation is taking place, where is God? And they rail against God and they, 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 they cry out against his injustice because they don't understand. But the reality is that God himself is limited by a legal system that must accept that Satan himself has certain rights. This is why everything has to be settled before the final reckoning. God will not intervene. God must allow justice to play out. Satan has his rights. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 4, you see also Abimelech making the same claim. Even though he wasn't a man who knew God as well as Abraham. But you know, he took, he took Abraham's wife because Abraham says, she's my sister. And he takes her, intending to make her his wife. But God comes to him in the night and says, Look, you are as good as a dead man. You are as good as a dead man. For the woman who you have taken, she's a man's wife. 
But Abimelech had not come near her, and he says, Lord, will you slay also a righteous nation? What is he appealing to? He's appealing to God's justice. God, you're going to kill somebody who, 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 who did this thing innocently? In the, in the integrity of my heart and the innocency of my hands have I done this. But notice his question. Will you slay also a righteous nation? Because what he's counting on and what he's appealing to is God's fair play, God's justice. And he knows that he has a point because he knows that God is a just God. And of course, God says, yes, I know that you did it innocently. That is why I never allowed anything to happen to you. I, I held you back from sinning against me. Um, you see that in the Bible, this, 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 this principle of God's fair play is, is very much highlighted. In Psalm, and, in Psalm 89 and verse 14, it says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. What does that mean? The habitation of thy throne means the foundation, the place where God lives. God lives in justice and judgment. And the word judgment means, I, 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 I understand it to mean the right application of justice. Justice and the way it is applied are the foundation of the throne of God. Meaning that God's throne is established and God's throne is maintained on the basis of God's fairness and God's fair play. Meaning that if God behaves in an unfair way, he's jeopardizing the foundation of his throne. Can you see why even in dealing with Satan, God has to be fair? God's, God's justice, God's legal system of right and wrong cannot change just because he's dealing with a thief or because he's dealing with a murderer or because he's dealing with a, a deceptive scoundrel. God cannot be dishonest even if the whole world becomes dishonest, even if all his enemies are liars and thieves and they are behaving in an underhanded way, God cannot behave in that way. This is why you as a Christian, when you come upon the, the evil people of the world and they use every device to destroy you, you cannot do the same thing. Why? Because you don't have the right? No, you have the right, but you don't have the, the right in God's eyes, based on God's system of right and wrong. You don't have the right to behave like a hooligan just because your enemy behaves like a hooligan. Because you have a different life. You live in a different world. You live in a different system. You don't behave like them because they serve a different master. But our God maintains his integrity and he will solve the sin problem in a legal, in a fair, in a righteous way regardless of how long it takes he will do it the right way and he will not be unfair and unreasonable and that is why sin continues up to this moment but as i said this legal system this legal system limits god and it explains certain things like suffering as i pointed out right one of the, the most painful things is to see the pictures of children starving to death. And I know that people have railed against God because of it, because they said, if, if I was God, do you think I would allow some of these children that you see sometimes in these photos with their bellies sticking out, or some of them you see the backbone through the belly? You think if I were God, I would allow this? I'm going to take another, another presentation, maybe, maybe next weekend. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. There, there, is, there is a reason why the choices that people make reflect on their families, reflect on their children, on their grandchildren. I'm not going to look at that today in depth. But I'm saying that there is a reason. And the reason has to do with God's, God's faithfulness to justice. God's faithfulness to certain principles. God has to be true to these principles. And when you understand it, it helps you to understand why there is suffering. Why sometimes you cry out to God, you pray, and there is no answer. Maybe not you, but maybe some people, they cry out to God and they pray and there does not seem to be an answer. Why is God silent? Why don't I get what I'm asking for? 
legal principles. Not legalism, mind you, not legalism, but legal principles which I regard as principles of fair play and justice. Goodness, God is good. And goodness necessitates fair play. A good person is a fair person. And, and God's goodness is in judgment. He is being judged. Somebody rose up one day and said, God is not good. God is not fair. God doesn't deal with us right. God, God wants to keep us as slaves. Somebody rebelled against God. And this person could not fight God by force of arms. He used arguments. He used deceptive arguments. And this is the root of all the evil that we have seen on this planet until this day. In solving this problem, God has to operate in a fair way. See what um, Paul says. Paul says in um, Romans 3 and verse 4. It says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Here the Apostle Paul suggests that there are times, or there will be a time when God is judged. It's a strange concept because all of us grew up with the idea that God is our judge and God will judge us. You don't find this in the Bible too often, but it is there that God himself is, is being judged. And a little thought will give us an explanation of why this is so. Look, God will not rule as a tyrant. God will not rule in a universe where he is not wanted. God will rule the universe because he's loved and he's admired and he's wanted. When we say, righteous and true are thy ways, O King of saints, just and true are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. You think it will be because God forces these words out of our mouth? No. It will be spontaneous, joyful, happy praise because this is what we see in our God. And in this universe, God will rule because we want him to be our king forever and ever. If we don't want him to be king, what kind of God would this be? That, that the, what kind of man is it that wants to stay with a woman who doesn't like him? Sick, right? sick you read about these crazy men and they end up doing some harm to the woman and you think what a sick fellow why doesn't he leave if he's not wanted why doesn't he leave god is not one of these sick persons god stays where he's wanted and he's he, he's a lovable person and therefore the universe needs to know that he's a lovable person but the point i'm making is that why do we want god because we have formed our judgment about god we have formed our judgment about God. We have judged God. I have judged God in a respectful way I say it, right? The picture I, had of God, I have of God today, I did not always have. And when my picture of God was wrong, I did not want God in my life. I didn't want him in my life. When I came to know him, I, 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 I formed a judgment about this God. And the more I know him, the more my judgment grows that I want nothing in my life but this God. I judge him based on what I see. And the verdict is, I don't want anybody else running my life but this person. I want him forever and ever. And Paul says, let God be true, but every man a liar. In other words, God must stand by the principles of truth. He must stand on the basis of what is right. Even if everybody else turns out to be a liar, God has to stand upon what is right. Why? Because when he is judged, he must be justified. In other words, it must be seen that God's ways are true and just and fair and righteous. So he cannot afford to step outside of that I mean, it's not just that he cannot afford to step outside of it. it. It is that it is not what he is. He cannot be untrue to himself. He will be true. He will stand by the right principles of fair play and justice, even when it hurts his cause. So that when we judge God, we can say, 
Yes, I can depend on this person because he's faithful and he always does what is right. If God was unfair with Satan, if God dealt with Satan in an unfair way, could I really trust him? If God treats his enemies in a way that is unfair, could I really trust him? I could say, when I'm your friend, I'm safe, but if I ever become your, your enemy, dog, eat my supper. Anyway, so God needs to be fair, and this, this, this need to be true, to live within this legal system of fair play and justice, this limits God. It ties the hands of God. That is something very important that everybody who loves God needs to understand. There are certain circumstances that ties the hands of God. I say it respectfully. I'm not disrespecting God. Nobody can stand against the power of God. God is almighty. But the justice of God, the principles of God, tie his own hands. You think if God's hands were not tied, he would have, let his son, he would have allowed his son to die alone on a cross, forsaken by his father? You think God wanted that? And yet God could not deliver his son because the system of justice does not permit Jesus to go free and you to be saved at the same time. No. God had a choice. Yes, he, he, he was between, to, put, to use a human term, he was between the devil and the deep blue sea. He could let Jesus go free and all of us be lost forever. Or he could save us and his son be separated from him and become one of us forever. He could not have both things because there's a system, there's a legal system that governs the way the universe is run. And God himself has chosen to be subject to that system. So the other important point I want to make is that fair play and justice, it has to override love. That's the second important point. The first point is that is that the legal system ties the hands of God. And everybody who is listening to me, I hope you know how I say this respectfully. I hope you understand what I mean. I'm not trying to belittle or put down God. I'm just saying that God's character causes him to be unable to work in a certain way. I hope you understand. The second important point I want to make is that fair play or the legal system overrides love. How is that? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. You know that I have a father. I had a father, an earthly father. He's dead now. But you know that I talk about him sometimes because I always use my father as an example of a man who loved his family. I don't set up my father as a paragon without fault, but I know that when it comes to loving his family, my father is one of the examples that I would always turn to. And I hope that I'm a similar kind of father. But one thing about my father that was a little disturbing to me was that he loved his children so much that he would give them the right, even when they were wrong. I mean, in terms of other people, if, my, if, if one of my brothers went out and interfered with some child and, um, you know, they got into some contention and the parents became involved, I don't remember my father giving the other child the right. And um, even as a boy, it kind of disturbed me, you know, I, I, I felt that that was somehow a fault in my father. He always gave his children the right. And I know he loved us, but I still felt that, no, you have to be fair. So, so that's what I mean. So the, 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 I'm asking the question, if a person is fair, does love cause you to step away from principles of right or of justice? You can't do that. Even though you love somebody, you still have to operate on the basis of what is fair. This is why billions of people will be lost. God loves them. God loves them. But what? Love cannot override justice. Love cannot override justice. If love is to save people, it has to operate within the parameters of justice. And, and the same justice indicates that some will be lost when they have not made when they have not accepted the provisions of that justice. 
This is why so many people will be lost. And people think, well, do I have to go the Christian way? Do I have to accept Christ? God's, God himself, because his hands are tied, God cannot save a person who does not go about things in the legal way. I'm just touching on a few things here today because I realize that there is need of a further, deeper ex, uh, exploration of some of these things, and I, I hope to do that in the future. But if you look at Deuteronomy 3, here's an example of what I mean. Deuteronomy 3 from verses 23 to 26. Look at this statement here. Moses talking to the people, and he's talking about the time when he sinned. He smote the rock instead of speaking to the rock. He says, and I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. Would not hear me. The God of love talking to his friend. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. God is, is speaking to his friend, more than a friend almost, more than a friend. And, and he, says to, he, he says to his friend, God, I'm begging you, just let me go over and see this good little land. And let me see this Lebanon. I want to see the promised land. I've been working for this for 40 years of my life. Please let me go over. And God says, be contented. Don't speak to me about this anymore. Wow, it sounds so hard. But it's an illustration of what I'm saying. God is bound by rules of right and wrong. And even though this is a little complicated, I don't want to get into it, but you can see that there is something that is, what, you think God is so mad with Moses? He's saying, look, I'm going to punish you. You broke my rule. You hit the stone instead of speaking to it. I'm upset and I'm mad and I'm not letting you go over. Absolutely not. Complete nonsense to think of it in this way. There is some principle at work here, and the principle is so strong that God cannot satisfy what his heart of love is telling him to do. Grant him this little request. He's your friend. Just let him go over. God says, I can't. I can't. God is bound by the legal system. God is bound by the legal system because God is fair even to Satan. Even to Satan. You remember in the book of Jude, it tells you about Michael coming for the body of Moses and Satan presents himself. How is Satan so barefaced and so presumptuous? Is because Satan understands his rights. He understands his rights. And he comes to stand on his rights. And he, know he, has, he knows he has rights because he knows God is fair and God gives him those rights. What I'm really trying to do today, brothers and sisters, is to, is to give us an understanding of the reasons why many times it seems like our prayers are not answered. Many times it seems like there are things we ask God for and we just don't seem to have been heard. But one other consideration is that there are legal impediments. There's a legal system in place. And, you know, I, I guess I'm going to say something here that I hope it doesn't sound wrong. But all of us have to be, in a sense, like lawyers. A lawyer learns the legal rules and he knows how to use those rules to obtain what he wants in spite of the system. He knows how to get around the system. And I'm saying, if we as God's children, the, the, the legal principles are outlined, and if we understand the system, we can know how to use those rules to obtain what we want. But we have to understand the legal rules, and we have to understand the system. That's what I'm saying. So, I want to go to this verse here that explains how to deal with this legal system comprehensively. First rule, number one, Revelation 12 and verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice in, saying in heaven, 
Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. We all know this passage very well. But I want you to notice something that according to this verse here, something arrived on planet earth. Something happened in the universe that had not been available before. Salvation came. Strength came. The kingdom of God came and the power of Christ came. So these are things at this point in time that we are looking at in this prophecy. These things came. And do they make a difference in this legal system? In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, look at what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is a verse that we could meditate on all day and find many sermons in it. But it says that the God and Father of Jesus Christ has, has, I'm going to add a word, has already, has already blessed us, already blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings. This refers to everybody who is listening to my voice, everybody in this room, and many more outside of it. We have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. So what I mean is this. What The point I'm making is this. When you come to God and you ask for something, do the legal impediments still apply? Does God still have to consider, are you legally entitled to this blessing? It's like when, when Daniel... Over there in Daniel 10, he came to God and he was praying for something. And the angel came and said, from the moment you started praying, I was sent. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia stood against me for 21 days. It's like Michael came for the body of Moses and Satan came to resist him. Does Satan have that right today? No. No. It says that God has blessed us now with all spiritual blessings. Yes. So those impediments don't exist anymore. God has removed them through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to talk about this in the next presentation, Amen. whenever that is. Amen. But it Amen. says, Amen. Thank you, Sister Anita. Now notice, notice the limitation, though. There is still a limitation. It says these blessings are in heavenly places, in Christ. Notice that limitation. Let me go down a few verses and show you something. He has chosen us. Wonderful. But look, he has chosen us in him. Mm -hmm. He has predestinated us unto the adoption of children. But where? By Jesus Christ. He has accepted us as his children. But look, he has made us accepted where? In the beloved. We have redemption, but where? In whom that is in Christ. The point is, brothers and sisters, that God's blessings, God's provision, God's healing, everything has already been given because salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have already arrived. But they have arrived only, only exclusively in Christ. Amen. There is still a legal limitation. That legal limitation is in Christ. On, 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 the, on the webinar, I made a point. I was making a point about Rahab and her family. You remember that they were destroying Jericho. And, and, and the, the spies told Rahab, look, the walls will fall down. Your house won't be touched. We're going to kill everybody, but your house won't be touched. All you do, make sure you put a scarlet rope through your window. And take your family, your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your father, your children, and make sure they are inside the house with the scarlet rope. Scarlet represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Everybody in the house is safe. Everybody outside, what do you get? Nothing. Everybody in the house, what do you need to do? Do you need to change your ways? Do you need to keep commandments? Do you need to be dressed a certain way? No, you only need to be in the house with the scarlet rope. That is where the safety is. And it is the same thing that Paul is saying here. 
everything that God has to give us is in Christ. Outside of him, there is nothing. The only qualification, there is a legal condition. In order to obtain the blessings, you must obtain them in Christ. If you look elsewhere, if you think, I've been faithful in paying my tithe. I've been faithful in going to, to worship. I've been faithful in studying my Bible. I've been kind to my neighbors. I've been loving to other people. And you expect that you're going to have your blessings on that basis? You are living in a delusion. The only basis, the only basis for these blessings is in Christ. Let me go to my, one, one of my, my, my many favorite verses, but this one is special. Verse 6, Ephesians chapter 1. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Every time I touch this verse, I want to talk for, for, for hours. Oh, it's so beautiful. Why is it so beautiful? Because there are so many ways we try to be accepted. Okay? We try so hard to eat the right food, to dress the right way, to keep the right friends, to go to the right places, to believe the right doctrines, so we can be accepted. And even in this world, to be accepted, even among certain friends, you have to conform in so many ways. To be accepted is a is a stressful thing and god says i'm taking it out of the, i'm taking the stress out of it i'm making it simple for you i'm taking you out of the way so i can really accept you you are accepted in the beloved isn't that the most beautiful verse in the entire world i am accepted not because of david clayton oh my god how wonderful David Clayton couldn't make it. I don't qualify. I have bad thoughts. I have bad behavior. I, I fail every now and then. David Clayton cannot qualify. God says, that's okay, my son. I have made you accepted in the beloved. All I ask is that you believe in my son. And you're accepted. Oh, my, it's so amazing. I, I, I like to say, God took me out of the way so he could accept me. He took me out of the way so he could accept me. I'm accepted in his son because I could not be accepted in myself. In the mornings when I get up to pray, this is the beginning of my prayer for the past few weeks. The beginning. First I say to God, and I'm not using hypocritical words. I think of it and I say, God, thank you because I know you love me. Number one, I know you want me. Number two, I know you accept me. Number three, and number four, I know you appreciate me. I am Amen. so blessed when I Amen. think that this is the truth about the God of heaven. Amen. And he made it possible God. in the beloved. He made it possible by giving me his son. So brothers and sisters, everything that we desire and we want are le is legally ours in Jesus Christ. Don't forget that part of it. Outside of Jesus Anything we ask God for is illegal. And if you're not asking in God, don't expect that God has a right to give it to you. God himself is bound by this because it's one human being who overcame Satan. It's one human being who escaped sin. It's one human being who gained glory. And God put everything inside this one man because he was qualified. And God says to the rest of us, look, if you will join yourself to this person, everything that is in him becomes yours. That's the legal limitation that God himself must work on. Those who are outside of God, look here. All the disasters that take place, those who are outside of Christ, all the disasters take place. You think God doesn't love them? But they are outside of the channel of blessing. That is the problem. Now the last point I want to make or this morning or this afternoon as the case may be is that these blessings have one other condition they are available in Christ and here is the other condition Acts 3 and verse 16 it says and his name his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong the power that is in Jesus Christ 
is ours, but it must be accepted through faith. Through faith in his name. This, brothers and sisters, is where the problem lies. Last night I made a point and I'm going to repeat it. I learned something as I was praying yesterday morning when I had that this back issue. When God just blessed me and, 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 and sealed up my back so, so beautifully. But while I was talking to him about it, you know, the thought came. I'm going to repeat it. Because I think I myself and maybe, maybe others of us got a little bit confused because there are spiritual gifts and one of the gifts is the gift of healing. And I've always thought, I've always uh, butted my mind about this question. If I don't have the gift of healing, how can I be involved in healing? And, and many times I would pray and I would say, God, I don't know if it pleases you. I would like to have the gift of healing. And sometimes I would say, well, I think you have given me the gift of teaching. And I really enjoy this gift. But maybe if you gave me the gift of healing, it would add to my ministry or something. I talk to God like this, okay? But I, I, I've never had any evidence that he has given me this gift. And I was talking yesterday morning and I was, you know, thinking about my, my back. And I was saying, how can I pray about this? If I were a healer, I would put my hand on it and it would be healed. But I, I don't have this gift. So how am I going to pray about this? And it struck me then, I got a little bit of, a, a, of an insight because I saw that Jesus says, Regardless of the gift of healing, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved and be planted in the sea, and it will obey. And he ended by saying, and nothing shall be impossible to you. He was not talking about the gift of healing. He was talking about simply believing in Jesus Christ. He was talking about simply believing in the faithfulness of God. You believe you don't need the gift of healing. But the gift of healing is something that you are given and regardless of whether your faith is strong or weak, when you have a gift, you have a gift. If you have the gift of tongues, you don't need to go back and, and, and stress yourself. Do I have enough faith to speak in tongues today? No, you have a language that is given to you and you can speak it. That's what I'm understanding about the gifts of the Spirit. Look at any of those gifts and they are yours. They are given to you and God does not take them back and you exercise them at will. But faith... Is a different thing. Faith is something that depends upon your relationship with Jesus in the moment. For example, Peter didn't have a gift of walking on water. Otherwise, he would have done it till the day he died. But he didn't have the gift to walk on water. But in the moment, his faith made him walk on water. And when he took his eyes off Christ, he began to sink. That's how faith works. And so, faith puts us into Christ. And when we have faith in the name of Christ, and that faith is real faith, we can do anything, we can move a mountain, anything. But you and I know, brothers and sisters, that the real challenge we have in our lives is to live and to walk in this kind of faith continually. So that's another legal limitation because God... And again, it's something I'm going to talk about more in the future too. God cannot operate. God does not, let me say, God does not normally operate in our lives outside of faith. We might ask why, but we can agree that it is so. God does not normally operate in the life of his people outside of faith. And if you ask why, I'm going to just suggest something and then I'm going to stop. If God is operating in a fair way, all right? Sister Jen, Sister Jenilyn says she's a Christian. Does that mean that everything she asks God for, God will do? Well, it means she has a right to every blessing that is in Jesus Christ because she's a Christian. But how do we know that she's a real Christian? How do we know that she has real faith? Because faith is not something you can see. I call faith the invisible tool. There is a door. And you have a tool to open the door, but the tool is invisible. Brother Beacon comes to the door and he tries his tool and it doesn't fit. And I come to the door and I try my tool and it doesn't fit. And Brother Dragon goes to the door and he uses his tool and the, to the door opens. And nobody knows what tool are we using because you cannot see the tool of faith. You just see Brother, Brother Beacon says, Lord, 
I believe, and nothing happens. But that David says, Lord, I believe, and nothing happens. Sister Jane comes and she says, Lord, I believe. And lo and behold, here is a miracle. None of us can see faith. But I believe God has established the blessings in Jesus in a way like this. When your key is able to fit the door, it will open. You don't need to prove your faith to anybody. God has set up the system in such a way that when a key is inserted in the door and it fits, the blessing will come. If you don't see the blessing, I'm not going to blame God because God says he has already given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to say God never gave because God says he has given. What I'm going to say is maybe your key is not fitting the door. Maybe your key is not fitting the door. God has placed this thing on a basis where Satan can't complain. Satan can't complain. Satan, Satan says, look, you're blessing an unbeliever. God says, how is that possible? An unbeliever cannot open the door. The very opening on the door, faith is a self-verifying tool. When faith works, you have faith. When faith doesn't work, you don't have faith. That's what I have come to conclude. When faith works, you have faith. When faith does not work, you don't have faith. And that is why God can say at the end, look at this verse. Matthew 25, verses 7 and 8. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. What do they know? They know that their lives are not demonstrating Christianity. Their faith is not showing forth any fruit. They have the evidence that something is wrong. They are virgins and they have lamps, but something is wrong. And what is wrong is not lack of effort. It is that they don't have true faith. Therefore, they don't have the Spirit of God. And it appears, it appears in their lives because the proof of faith is that faith works. Let me say that again. It, 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 it's a kind of strange thing to say, but it is a fact. The proof of faith is that faith works. If it doesn't work, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm very sensitive to the fact that I don't want to say to people, go out there and tear out your hair and stagger yourself and kill yourself to try to obtain faith. Nonsense. You don't get faith like that. What I'm saying that faith is a consequence of your gaze upon Christ. Faith is a consequence of understanding God's word, finding Jesus and finding that word in Christ. I'm saying, I know that my faith does not always work the way it should. I know that sometimes my faith falls short of the mark. I'm not tearing my hair. I'm not stressing myself. I'm turning my eyes back to Christ and I'm going to fix my eyes there and let Flow from him to me what I need. That's all I worry about. But I'm just saying this because I want us to understand, brothers and sisters, that we don't blame God. Don't ever become stressed about it and say, maybe God is not hearing you. Maybe God is not working for you. No. There are limitations, but God has dealt with those limitations by giving us Jesus Christ. But remember that if our faith is misplaced, we are not able to access those blessings in Christ. So that's where I'm going to stop today with thanksgiving to all of you for having been so patient and so attentive. I'm going to close off here, but before I do, um, Brother Ian is going to bless us with a song, and then afterwards we'll have the closing prayer, and then I will leave a little room if we have the appetite for some questions or comments we'll have a little bit of that so brother Ian, over to you thank you so this is a hymn i'm i'm gonna sing and uh, probably uh, perhaps a well-known hymn so with your mics mute maybe you want to sing along We know 
not the hour of the Master's appearing. Yet signs are foretell that the moment is nearing when he shall return to the promise most daring. But we know. Watch and be ready, he will come, he will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, he will come in the clouds of his father's bright glory, but we know. Light for the wise who are seeking salvation. There's truth in the book of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation, but we know. Watch and be ready, he will come, he will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, he will come in the cloud of his father's bright glory. Amen. 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 Amen.